we have a, a good hour and a half together, and our purpose this morning is to talk about local uh, energy production and distribution, and hopefully spend as much time talking uh, amongst ourselves as presenting. Uh, my name is Dana Morin, and I'll, I'll open up the presentation this morning and try to get our brains flowing and, and set a framework that allows uh, uh, Don, Bob, and Eric to uh, follow me with a, a 10 to 12 minute presentation from each of us. Uh, before we do that, in the spirit of knowing what's who we all are, let's do a quick run through the room. Where you're from, and why you're here. Can I start with the lady standing up. Oh, I'm Carrie Clam. I'm from Warden. Just an interesting citizen. Okay, sir. Uh, Len Barron from Boulder, Colorado. I'm uh, just uh, interested in getting lots of information. Welcome. Sure. Uh, Michael Atkins, uh, peculiar. I live in Toronto. Uh, I'm the chair of the board of Laurentian University in Sudbury, but I live in La Haye in the summer, and I'll probably be here more, and I wanted to see what you guys were doing. Great. Go down the line. Uh, Joanne Beckett from uh, Capillary, New Brunswick. Watershed Water Group, Watershed Water Group, um, I'm Garth Lynn, and I'm a Pathfinder consultant, and I'm interested in citizen uh, for Fredericton. Um, and I just want to learn, I, I like building better houses, but I also want to build better communities. Mercedes Bryan, I'm the town council of Wolfson. Sir, uh, Mark Mark I live uh, on the south shore and the journalist by trade and I've written about October and Manage School, so I'm interested to catch up. Good. My name is Bob Ashley, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Summerside in Prince Edward Island. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Eric, Eric, Eric um, Christmas. I'm the Director of Operations for the Bomas on Mi'kmaq Wind uh, uh, Company. Hi, I'm Don Reagan. I'm here as the Superintendent of the Berwick Electric Commission, a municipal owned utility, and also Summerside manages one. Perfect. Well, I'll jump into uh, my presentation. And essentially, we just wanted to get our, our collective brains uh, working. And this is a large topic, I think, when we talk about local energy and local distribution. And uh, I'll then follow up with a little bit of personal experience. The, uh, some of this, because I'm born and bred Nova Scotian, is, is somewhat centric to Nova Scotia's path. But I think it's very parallel to most, most communities. And those from here. Uh, my mum's a bent, and my the other half are Marshalls, so that makes me half bent, and good to be in the name. Makes <laughs> good to be in. Yeah, let's uh, see if I can perform the thing. Right now, I'm working uh, with Funday Tidal Inc. Uh, here in Digby County area in the Bay of Funday, doing tidal energy, uh, specifically community-owned tidal power, and uh, because of that, I'm chair of different research organizations and in our industry association in Canada. Prior to that, last. 12 years of my life, I've been doing community energy projects around CEDIFs and community feed-in tariffs with the uh, Scotian Winfields network of uh, companies. There is a panel on CEDIFs going on down the, down the uh, hallway that I really wanted to be at, and I wanted to be at the culture and heritage because that's my other background. But uh, we'll stay focused on this one. And uh, Music Nova Scotia uh, on the cultural sector side is uh, one of my loves. Uh, that has nothing to do with this panel today. I'm shamelessly promoting the East Coast Music Awards and our great artists today. Um, I'm not going to make the definition. I'm going to throw this back in the room. In fact, the next slide that defines what local uh, energy production and distribution, I thought I would throw out back to all of us to have some kind of understanding of what that is. Uh, depending on what hat you're wearing, when we get into being electricity people, those, those are strong words, uh, distribution and transmission lines, and we get into electricity. I just wanted to throw some things out. You know, what are we talking about energy production locally? To, and uh, is this different between the local distribution transmission system? Is this the transmission lines that leave this community and go to Halifax and beyond? Or when we talk about community is that a public? Is that private? Is that nonprofit? Personal? What what matures is that? In other words, th does ownership of uh, of the production of the energy and the distribution is that part of our discussion today? Um, also about local consumption and usage. A part of uh, listening to Robert and and Michael this morning, I think it does mean that we're we're using that energy or that supply locally, uh, as opposed to exporting it at this stage out. 
And are we also just talking electricity today? Are we, are we getting into some other exciting areas like transportation and fuel and heating, efficiency, uh, all the other areas that might go into local? So for a definition for today, I'm just going to scoop by that. You know what? I saved the wrong presentation. I'm not the wrong one. <laughs> Just change the topic of the day. No. <laughs> like, it's actually a beautiful presentation. <laughs> All right. We're going we're gonna to do it. Uh, it's fine. Just two slides, hopefully. And if you see an XXX that stands for a date, I couldn't remember as I was finishing it last night. Anyway, the good one's on my... Uh, hard drive and we'll put it up to the website afterwards. Um, so these are the nature of the questions. So I'm just going to throw it back out. What do you think this uh, local energy and, and distribution production really, uh, what it means to us? Well, I, th I think one key thing for me is that they, they, uh, cutting down the cost of transmission. So you don't have a muskrat falls sending electricity that has to be boosted all the way along before it gets to where it's used. Oh, sorry. Before, before it gets to where it's used. On, or I suppose it is, yeah. Um, but that uh, the energy is created within the 10 or 25 ra mile radius area where it's needed. Right. And so, among other things, it makes it less susceptible to disasters and uh, political interruptions. Okay. Anyone else have a, a definition or some parameters that are guiding us today? Sir. My greatest concern is you look at history, usually, right now, for example, wind, it's our resource, but are we going to benefit from it? Or are we going to, be, are we going to wait for outsiders to develop it and, and take it away from us? Because yeah. that's the road we're on right now. Right. Um, my biggest concern, I guess, is I live in a part of the Maritimes that has some of the best wind potential uh, that exists. Unfortunately, we're on a bird flyway, and of course, you know what that means. You can't put up windmills because you might kill the birds. Uh, but my big question is this. Uh, energy on PEI, especially wind energy, with the exception, I believe, of Summerside, uh, is under the very tight control of government. And uh, I get the impression that this conference is, uh, I won't say anti-government, but it's uh, certainly more local and municipal than it is provincial. And I just wondered what you gentlemen thought about how we, as a local area, could somehow or other uh, get rid of our government and take over our energy. <laughs> I think that's a different panel uh, <laughs> at the end. Here in the basement. Um, actually, Teresa, you know, I think what happened is I, this is the presentation I sent a week ago as a, as a template, and um, it was put on a stick at break time. Did you get a stick here? Uh, I didn't. Evan, <laughs> There's the root. Let's ask a couple more people. If we could replace this, it would make me a lot more comfortable and happy. That I made animations and things that I've, <laughs> that I've never used before, and, and what a waste of time. I was late last night making headlines pop up and down. Someone nice else while we other. just uh, fill that in on, uh, sir. Uh, in my experience uh, over the years, there's, uh, yep. there's the value of, of the energy, which is one part of it, but the value of the independence is far more important. And I think you have to understand the difference. Uh, there's a, up where I do some business, there's a fantastic place called Manitoulin Island, and they have lots of wind. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, organizations has put lots of uh, 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 windmills up, but unfortunately all they do is feed the grid. And so they just kill birds without any particular local advantage. And if you want to change your community, you have to be in charge of it. If you want to be in charge, it's going to be energy and it's going to be food. So you might as well get started. Yes? This may be left field, but I guess I'm interested in, in, in the idea of wild energy, and that includes water. Uh, and uh, so I'm interested in sort of who's doing what. Um, 
I, I'm interested in sort of all those wild energies, including water. And so I'm, um, so I'm, I'm just, I'll be listening to to see if anybody else is speaking about about how we make better use of of all the snow, for example, that we've had this winter, and are we just going to let it run off, or, or you know, how do we how do we use that that what I consider local or wild energy as well? Good. We'll take one more, and then we'll uh, we've got 45 minutes. So take two more because I saw a disappointed face. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, one of the overriding principles in, in energy use, and no matter what type of energy it is, is always to reduce what you consume before you produce more, because the cost of production and all the infrastructure is, is huge. And this also speaks about the, the Manitoulin example. If we're making, building turbines, and I'm not picking on turbines, I have my own personal opinion about them, but I'm going to leave that out of this. If we're building those to export that energy, um, there's a lot of a line loss in, in that, and that's just a technical point of pushing those electrons down that conductor, and, and it's lost energy. And so we have to produce so much more. The gear has to be bigger. We have to produce more units to do that. If we do local energy, everything is smaller gauge, uh, in not only size but in, in, in its impact. And also, if we do it locally, we have redundancy built in the system. And all of us, uh, I was on a... a uh, an off-grid home when the grid went down uh, and all the eastern seaboard was, was down. And the, the owner of the place called me and said, uh, you're probably blissfully unaware that all the eastern seaboard is down. And my 12-year-old son was caught in an elevator in the Bata Shoe Museum in Toronto at the time when that went down. So there was two extremes in the family of reliability on the grid. And uh, so I just want to speak to that, that if, if we do local, if our grid goes down, our local grid, it doesn't affect our neighbor, but maybe they can give us some power while we're waiting. So local means redundancies in systems and uh, some overlap and infrastructure costs. Now, I know that speaks to a lot of uh, big corporations that have interest in power and that, but whose interest is it in? Is it in the shareholders or is it in the people who are actually using the, the, the commodity? Because that's, that, that's what it is. Our electrons are now commodities. Okay. We'll take one more on the side, I think. Um, my point was also about efficiency. Efficiency, I believe, has to be the building block of renewable <coughs> energy sustainable um, energy system. And in the local, if, if municipalities actually want to do something and do something fast, um, creating a program where you pay for building retrofits with energy dollars saved is actually one program that municipalities can actually get going on their own. They don't have to wait for anything. They just have to get the clearance. I know there's some provincial laws that make it difficult, but it's probably the easiest way. And energy saved is also the <coughs> most sustainable energy. Well, thanks, everybody. That's, uh, I hope we've reversed how we start these things and have a chat first, which I think can shape. Uh, we've got a different variety of uh, people at the front here from uh, municipal utilities to uh, uh, private sector as well. Um, now that I have my better slides up, uh, definitely the point of efficiency. And are we talking today about uh, local production used right at your own home or within your own business? Because that's not distributing. It's not moving it somewhere else. Um, and also, are we just talking about electricity, which I, I'd like to have a bigger discussion, which has already happened here uh, as well. And to me, it is important who owns it and how it's controlled and who manages the energy projects. So um, whether that's local shareholders, uh, the municipality, I, I tend to favor that over large utility projects, not to exclude those from happening at all. I, the first slide that I ran was about the announcement in December that our jobs in Canada, our clean tech sector, had surpassed our fossil fuel jobs uh, for the first time. And my point around that is where are the jobs in the fossil fuel sector? And I have a lot of friends coming home right now. Uh, they're all out west or they're out at sea, whereas to me, local production, local energy, all the jobs, you don't have to go anywhere. You can go big and stay home. So it's a very to me a very important fact is where is the work in that particular energy business. So for today, we, uh, I'm going to leave this blank and this afternoon when we do this session again, we'll leave it blank and then uh, I'll synthesize a definition that, that works for, for both sessions before we post this up to the website. 
today. Yesterday, actually. Uh, I don't know if we have someone from Tata Magush here in the room or not. I didn't hear Tata Magush, but the North Shore Cooperative uh, to me is very interesting. We have a lot of community <coughs> initiatives in Nova Scotia, but this is now one going beyond that where we're going to own the grid itself and the storage and other infrastructure as opposed to just the generation, and I find that very fascinating. Uh, we've got a this new battery that Tesla is making meant for your home that's going to using solar and other sources that charges your car and the house and you're totally off grid. I get excited about that from yesterday. Uh, free beer, uh, renewable energy brought to you by Fee Free Beer came at me yesterday. I, I opened that immediately. But on a serious point, these are all hypertext links, by the way, so that when you do get the presentation, they're there. This is the island of Samso. And uh, uh, the group that I've worked with, we began on Briar Island just down the road here on a very small island, and SAMHSA has done it, and it's sort of like uh, uh, gauzing that we heard this morning. It is an island that now uh, exports energy, and all the islanders are shareholders, and they're all making money and supporting their local economy, which has become a tourism hub for clean communities and municipalities come to check it out, how they did it. And there were other ones out of PEI, this uh, Jason Aspen, who's moved to the community, saying 100% organic, but also 100% uh, renewables. And these are business people moving into PEI and our own Surrett Battery Company here locally. So uh, I was in Chile in uh, December and got to go to some UN climate change stuff. And uh, the main paper released was that locally controlled renewable energy is about climate justice uh, on the planet. So all these linked to larger articles. But today's topic uh, right at the moment is very poignant and happening every day. I get so many emails on this topic, and it's somewhat getting bewildering, the amount of technologies and, and news and good news that we hear each day. But let's look at the past. Back in the 1800s, I don't think this is much different than the rest of Canada's growth. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, gas and light companies uh, first before light. And... Uh, then electric trams came along and, and the need for electricity grew. And it wasn't until 1887 or something that we had a, started having power dams grow in Nova Scotia uh, and, uh, by private companies. And uh, in 1919, the province formed its, its main Nova Scotia Power Commission. Uh, and we see other smaller utilities going around all around the province and small generators. And my main point, and, and Dawn is one of them, the remaining six municipal utilities still in play. Um, in the old days, everybody made energy in their <laughs> communities. Everybody distributed it. Uh, it was the way it was done. We had small family companies like the Jodry family, if you're from Nova Scotia, it's how they began. Uh, it's just the way it was. There was not uh, centralized energy. It's in the Rural uh, Electrification Act here and about the same time across Canada that we centralized to have large power producers that sent the power out to communities uh, and that has served as well for whatever, the last 60 years. Uh, but in that model, the wires get thinner and thinner until you get to Briar Island where there isn't one. And uh, it wasn't meant to make rural energy and take it back to Halifax uh, up the line. So we're at a different point now. Uh, the main point of this slide is in 1992, the, the government privatized the um, utility in Nova Scotia. And that has, uh, we have a private monopoly, uh, for lack of a better word, for many years. And now we have some independent power producers. So it sets the stage in Nova Scotia. Uh, once everyone produced and distributed down to no one else but the private utility. And then we have what's going on shortly after that time. The impetus for community energy, uh, really in 1999 we had something called the CEDIF program began, a way of pooling our, our money in our community, not just for energy but other great things. And at the same time, the seed that renewable energy was important, that reducing carbons, and that Nova Scotians could actually afford to own wind turbines and those type of things and uh, be players and benefactors. And a group out of Windsor, Nova Scotia, Brian Watling and his crew uh, came up with this model. And uh, I showed up shortly later to attempt to implement it. Uh, it's at the same time we started getting some wind producers around the province, not just Nova Scotia power producing themselves, but independents. And uh, once that was all done, up to 2005, uh, we started Fundy Tidal Inc., the same people that uh, started the community wind efforts, same model 
community owns the Bay of Funday and the resources in its community and has the right to manage it and own it. Uh, so that's where we began in 2006. In 2010, the big part for community energy, and I think this is a globally important program, the community feed-in tariff has enabled uh, energy projects around the province from multiple different groups and combined with the seed if it truly is unique. Uh, there is certainly no small-scale tidal tariff in the world except here and that's brought a lot of business and attention to us. So these are two key, very key things that have occurred. Uh, this community feed-in tariff for, for, for you that are from away, um, uh, three or four or five years ago we set up a program that has that to incentivize or enable uh, communities and other interests to generate electricity, including First Nations, the universities, the municipalities, cooperatives, and these CDF groups, these groups of community investors were allowed to participate. And they put out a call for energy that has been mostly wind, small wind, large wind, some uh, <coughs> biomass related or biogas projects. Um, <coughs> and some title projects, and I'm missing one. So we had a variety of things emerge from the universities and the municipalities and, uh, and per me? combined heat and power as well, uh, a few initiatives <coughs> around that. So they've proliferated large part in wind. Uh, this is, I like the part about the five different uh, proponents that are eligible that are deemed uh, community, and it gives us some more shape perhaps to our definition that when these institutions or groups are, are formed. And there's also some nonprofits involved in the in the comfit. I should have, I did non for profit. Like the SPCA was has partnered with a wind developer, and the profits from that are going back to the SPCA. So I think a part of community energy is also if there are profits, where did they go? Is really important to me. Uh, we're working with both municipality of Clare and Digby and the town to set up a community energy trust, which essentially uh, provides some of the debt financing and owns infrastructure on our projects. Mainly because I found in large energy projects all the money goes to the bank and the bank isn't in Nova Scotia. So our good community projects, we buy equipment from away and we borrow money from away and we get shareholders from away. It's called Nova Scotia Power. No, um, I'm not going to get into CDF. it's the room down the hall. It is a mechanism, a tax-based uh, mechanism that provides a government's governance structure that brings together uh, a minimum of 25 shareholders in a community to pool their money together. There are examples here from all over the province. Uh, Rankin McSween is here today from Cape Breton. I think he's the godfather of CETUS up there, what they have done with community funds uh, in so many different areas is amazing. Uh, we have farmers, uh, we heard of the um, FarmWorks this morning, which provides loans uh, to farmers, uh, and then we have what's called blind pools that, that invest in many companies, the funeral home, the garden community center. It's about what do you want to put your money at. It's not about energy in any way. It's just a way to pool your money and receive substantial tax credits. Uh, my stats are a little old. About $65 million in, in Nova Scotia has been put into that, about 8,000 shareholders. PEI has adopted this program. New Brunswick is about to, so it's uh, it's active in PEI. And uh, I'm not sure New Brunswickers is it implemented now? I think it's. In, pardon me. In, okay. Except they haven't. They're waffling because they, they're saying the legislation is going to take a long time. Yeah. So they're not. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. Because they brought it in as a political movement going into the election, and now it's just sitting there. So yeah. the, the legislation is complicated. That's a comment from bureaucrats. Yeah, it's a stroke of a pen. Um, to enable you to invest your own money in your own projects is, is I know, a lot of paperwork. Um, <laughs> two things. You can buy common voting shares or, or debt. I won't get too much into CETUS. It's a way you will have different mechanisms in New Brunswick, Ontario, uh, Colorado. You're just looking for a way that organizes your community and provides the most protection. If there's tax breaks, incentives, take advantage of them. If they're not, you don't do these things because of tax breaks. Um, this ComFit thing, we uh, over $21 million has gone into energy projects in the last two years raised. Win for All is a, com uh, a community group that came to Nova Scotia and established as opposed to us old timers that were here and used the model and have done really well, <laughs> raising millions of dollars. And, uh, but our biggest and most prolific is Just Us Coffee. If you're a coffee fan of organic and uh, coffees, 
it is a CDF and it, it's all owned by its shareholders and workers. So it's a, just a model that can be applied. Enough of that. Uh, the Scotian Winfields would be the ones that started this. There are eight community uh, investment funds around the province. They grew over a, a, an eight year period. Uh, fortunately, I started seven of them and was president of them, seven of them at the same time, not advised. Uh, <laughs> In the beginning, there were no wind companies. There, there was just a, an idea that if we put our money together, we could uh, uh, change the rules to be, to be allowed to make energy at that time in Nova Scotia. You weren't allowed. So we formed Renewable Energy Services, which has gone on to work in Alberta and other places and own assets around the province. And then we formed Scotian Windfields. When those guys left, we needed a new company that we knew was owned by all these guys. So all these community groups own the mothership. The mothership now has 65 megawatts of ComFit going up all over the province, so it's, I'm quite proud of what's happened. Um, and Funday Tidal, uh, the same group of people that started this group, uh, again, plying the model. But also now that you have investment funds started, they were the seeds, you know, the five, the ten grand to get you going. So we began to spin out companies as a group of investment funds. Over time, though, some of them said, well, that's fine. Scotian Winfields is off building projects on the South Shore, but they're not in our community. So some of them said, well, we'll do it ourselves. So there's, they're a mix. They have investments in other companies doing projects, and now they own their own projects that they're actually doing directly in their community and maintaining them. So an evolution over time. Um, and the next one will be a really nice brew pub that will use the energy. That's why I got into this a long time ago. Um, okay, uh, right now, today, the present. With these changes over time, we still have Nova Scotia Power as a private utility. We have six municipal utilities that I'll leave to Don to speak about. We have a variety of independent power producers around the province now uh, with larger wind efforts. And then our, our community projects uh, by the, the five different proponents. We do have net metering in Nova Scotia. It's not... Um, maybe as robust as some other jurisdictions that you can make electricity at home and use it and if you have some extra in some places you get to sell that directly some places it's credited back towards you but the, the point is having extra energy and selling it and distributing it to your neighbor uh, and finally renewable to retail uh, the link goes to the government website but we've been uh, I don't know what it is nine months now uh, deregulating and making new market rules to enable uh, an opening of the market so that right now you're not allowed to sell power to anyone but Nova Scotia Power essentially and even the community feed-in tariff, someone's point, we sell it to someone else and we purchase it back from the utility. The difference is I'm going to sell you the power directly and I can knock on your door but it also allows me to control the price and, and when you get into municipalities that's I think what makes this community different than the one down the road from an electricity price there isn't one. There's no advantage to set up in Il Madam as it is over in La Have. Uh, until you're in control of some way of your energy rates, then you can say businesses come down to Annapolis because we have a, a competitive energy supply. But right now that's not the case. This renewable of retail, the rules come out September of this year, and it's quite an advancement in how we will be able to operate uh, at the distribution level, not on the big transmission grid, but here at home. Uh, and be able to, I, we will see new companies emerge and new ways of doing things in September. So this is part of the electricity review of the last year to, to make more changes in Nova Scotia that enable more production. Quick case study and shameless self-promotion. Uh, the Bay of Fundy, the, the world's ties, tides, and the flow of those currents uh, passing through the minus channel number one is enough to, if you could extract it, uh, the power of the province. We're involved in projects at the end of the province here, much smaller. They have great potential, 67 megawatts is nothing to scoff at, 12, 5. You have enough grid capacity to get less than 2 megawatts out. So to all of that energy, we cannot get it out. You can't export it back up to the city or to other places that would use it. So naturally, uh, 10 years ago, what does that leave you with? Well, we need to use the electricity here. We need to attract people to come and use our electricity. We need to convert that to food, sustainable transportation, whatever, instead of the wire. Forget about the wire. Don't have one, and it would cost a billion dollars to get one all the way up 
to past here. I think Tremont or something, as far as transmission lines, is quite a ways. Mm -hmm. It's from, insulated from, for a higher voltage, but the transformers aren't adequate for it. Yeah. So a lot of infrastructure that would be required. Uh, but I always say that's worrying about, I'll worry about that after our community has all the power it needs. Because that's what you're worrying about, really, is how do I send the excess over to my neighbor, and uh, that's another. That's a different game than local distribution. So there's lots of tidal power, um, and I'll just share my personal story. Sitting on Briar Island with some friends who had started wind projects together, and uh, the talk at the table over tea and maybe rum sometimes is the community's dead, the fishery's gone, we're down to the lobster, uh, all the processing plants are closed, the parking lot is not full of cars anymore, the kids have all gone out west. What can we do to bring them home? Uh, we're seasonal now. We have four months the place is open. We do whale watching. The, uh, even this morning it was quiet. We're not quite into tourism season here in Annapolis, but I think some were hunting for coffee at 7. You were hard pressed. Uh, in, the winter, in the winter on Briar Island, everything's closed. So you know, we have to rent a house and everyone stay in it. Uh, travels, issues in a rural community. Uh, the big part was about the kids. We've dwindled so far. There's little schools closed now. Once that's gone, it's even worse. And we had no uh, community health nurse. All the other things the community needs to be healthy and vibrant. And so we sat around, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? We really know this CDF program. We know how to bring money together, but what should we do with it? There's no more wind to be done in the, on those islands, um, saturated plus a bird migratory path. Um, so we said, well, what's the enabler? that would enable us to have this bigger picture view of things. Because the bigger picture is what we are talking about. The, this having our, our, first we tried to have our own wind turbines that would power the whole island and we would own them. And that uh, was not doable because of the bird sanctuary, et cetera. But it was a means to win. You know, really spent a, a few years on sustainable transportation, looking at in detail local food supply and agriculture. So if there's 210 people on this island and 935, how many turkeys do we eat a year? We have three in our house every year. We buy them up at Sobeys. So we do, you know, whatever the math was, 1,143 times four turkeys. There's enough there for someone to have a turkey firm. And on went the math. Eggs was hard. We eat too many eggs. Ecotourism and recreation is a big part of it, culture and heritage, health, wellness, public infrastructure, real estate development, sustainable energy. And like in this community, I'm sure that people wear many hats. I'm the municipal counselor and I have them at the store and the volunteer fireman and I'm the deacon of the church. Is you're hard to have a discussion in a, in a, in a uh, municipal group where it's like, well, that's a public thing. That's public infrastructure going to fix the sewer, Jimmy, not private money that I'm... So you have these um, public-private... No, that's best for nonprofits. That's a private thing. We need to get money from the government for that. So, and point being, that was the mission, the enabler. We said if Digby County could become the hub of tidal power in the world, oh my God, what, what would that do? Uh, we would spend that money locally. We would create those jobs locally. It's all about local supply chain. When you're working in the ocean, you can't send people from away to come and do that local job. Um, also, we knew it would take, there were no policies, no rules, no legislations, no permits that we would have to spend six or seven years creating all new laws, research and development. We have almost every university working in, in Digby County now, all kinds of young people, postdocs, the, the bed and breakfast is full all summer, they're there in the winter and that's a big, big change for that community. And then we said, well, let's go bigger, why don't we have a research center where everybody in the world comes in a test site? and demonstration, now we're cooking, if we can get the port of Digby to be the service center for all of the Digby, uh, for all of the Bay of Funday, the big project, now we're getting somewhere. And now we actually have some new people, and it was all about the tax base. There's enough people in the community to have a barber shop again, right? And uh, so that was the, I share the story because I think it's the same as everyone else in the room when we get into these energy things. Why am I doing this community economic development? It wasn't about, I'm going to make a lot of money or uh, bring the kids home, make some jobs here, make things better, and support existing businesses that are already here. If we had another 50 people coming and going, the store can stay open, the restaurants are good. And we started measuring success by one family moving to the island, two families, one minute, liar. <laughs> so fun day title, uh, 2006, again the same group of us, our mandate and the vision proactively create opportunities uh, that have socioeconomic benefit to everyone in the community. 
can't have our business with, at the detriment of someone else's. And here we are in the middle of uh, doing, I think, a new $3 million research project over the summer uh, that we're working on. This, the last two slides, if they're the most important part, what would be the socioeconomic benefit? And you'll see a report this month from our province on the benefit of tidal power looking forward. What would they be? And so our projects are $33 million. So my question is, as we spend this money in the next two and a half years, and they spend $150 million up the Bay of Fundy for those projects, where is it all going? To the tax base, what are, what's the impact of having eight staff from Fundy Title here and 12 from Open Hydro? We have about 30 researchers coming now. And then if all the companies that are supplying our turbines and everybody has to come, you have hospitality, all the bed and breakfast, the real estate, all these other issues. Those that are lending the money and the shareholders, which are from Nova Scotia, if there's any profits, they will profit. And more importantly, the new and full-time part-time residents. And everybody knows about Briar and Long Islands around the world who are into tidal power, and they're all coming to visit. Oh, I'll come back for vacation. I'll bring the wife in the summer. Or I'll bring my husband. And it's become a... Uh, it's a gorgeous place. Once you get people to see Annapolis Royal or a Digby, they go, this is a nice place, and the real estate is dirt cheap compared to where I come from. So, um, I won't go through this, but I think the obvious benefits of not just an energy company or any company in your community about new residents and new businesses, etc. The future, last slide. What is the future? I see it all becoming decentralized again, moving back out, smaller productions, locally used. All renewable energy, the efficiency, it's about not using the damn stuff if you don't have to, but also 100% net zero homes and homes and businesses that actually are producers of electricity. This whole wonderful time of smart grids and smart meters and what that enables us to do. Uh, storage, and I really like my independent generation, and we spent all these years focusing on electricity as the main reason we have greenhouse gases, and it's less than 50%. It's the it's the driving and the transportation and the boats and everything else, so it's now time to, to fix that problem, too. Back to the moment. We're going to move over to Don and uh, from the Berwick uh, Commission, and then we'll move down the line. Okay, can everybody hear me? Um, I'm a... Sure. Sure. <laughs> Do a shuffle. So oh, well, all the trade, that's why I got go. in this business. <laughs> and I've worked for the Berwick Electric Commission for, oh, 37 years or something like that. <laughs> this is me, yeah, local electricity. That's how we started, as Dana said. The genesis of electricity was community stuff. People wanted to use uh, energy, and they found a way to do it. And um, Berwick had hydro, Wolfville and Kenfield had steam, uh, coal-fired steam, various solutions throughout the province and a lot of ingenuity into it. How does this work? Okay, no, that's not the right, yeah. So over time, there was a, an accretion of the local utilities, local distribution companies by larger entities. I don't like to read slides to people, so I won't. <laughs> Dana touched on this, and uh, we come down to what can we do now that's useful and local and not part of our communities. I'm going to talk about something about how, how municipalities can do that, because that's partly what I know best, and because there are some good opportunities there. Community feed and tariff, which has been mentioned, is a, is a great opportunity, but they've halted intake for now, so that, there's not going to be any bit more of that developed until they find some way to integrate more renewables into the grid. But transfers of energy, electricity from one municip municipality to another are permitted under the MGA, the Municipal Government Act, and there's a, I have some copies of that section of the Act if anybody wants to look at them. It's never been done. But is that my call? Um, net metering can be used in this way as well. 
So this speaks to net metering, enhanced net metering. You can, you can uh, set up a net metering of, of up to a one megawatt in Nova Scotia, and you can distribute on the same distribution node to all the properties that you have within that node. And for a municipality, that could be a powerful tool because they all have different facilities from town halls to treatment plants to whatever. The municipal transfers I referenced, they're, um, I don't think this, this has actually ever been done. You'd need to use the uh, transmission system to do this, but it is, it is legally possible and it, somebody should look into it. PACE, PACE is a program we've started in Berwick. Halifax has one. The Halifax program is based on solar hot water. Uh, they're about to expand that to photovoltaic. We're using it to fund um, energy efficiency upgrades to properties, both um, residential and commercial within the town. And it can, it can fund um, envelope improvements, uh, photovoltaics, solar hot water or solar heat, and or heat pumps. So it's a, it's a powerful program. It works well. We've got probably 10 people on it now. We just started in the fall. And uh, we expect quite a bit more. So here's what it's about. And those are all benefits which directly flow back to the, to the community. Useful program. Berwick's run a hydro plant for almost 100 years now. And uh, we're, we, along with Anaganish and Mahone Bay, are building a wind generation facility that will provide between 9 and 16 megawatts of energy to us when it's completed. It's, we're building it in two stages. Um, we're very much in the energy business and have some expertise in it. I'd be glad to talk to people or if there's anything I can do in the way of advice to help, I will. Next one up. Next one. I think it's over to Bob. Oh, it me? Just because of the... Uh, okay. Wow, it's written down. <laughs> <laughs> so it is written, so it shall be done. Hi, my name's Bob Ashley. And I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Summerside. And I, I think what we're doing in Summerside probably re should resonate with uh, some of the comments that we heard this morning um, from you people. We have a program called My Power Net. And it's a combination of uh, combining ancient technologies with new ones. And uh, I'm, I'm not a... Uh, what I call one of the priests of power, like like Dana or Don, who uh, are one of the techno techno geek uh, electro freak guys. I'm just a <laughs> I'm just a I'm just an administrator. So uh, be glad I'm here because everything is in lay language. I hope. Next. Oh, I'll let I'll let you do it. Then I can concentrate. Does anybody know what the uh, structure is in the background? Sweat Lodge. Just remember that. Next slide. That's a windmill. Uh, different function back in the 1500s, 1600s, uh, grinding grain, but still using energy for that purpose. Next one. Anybody know what that is? It's a signal tower. Uh, the configuration of the arms allow for 196 different combinations, configurations, and can be seen miles away. So it's a communications device. Next one. My point here is that all these old technologies work. Next slide. So what we're doing in Summerside has an analog with each of the three old technologies I've shown you. More or less, we've just uh, upgraded the, the efficiency of, of the wind turbines. The sweat lodge, we've uh, adapted for use in storage of the wind energy in the form of heat. And uh, the city of Summerside sells and services uh, uh, thermal storage units which can be used to heat space, uh, homes and businesses, and or hot water. Uh, we've got about 270 of these installations. 
The primary reason for this was that wind energy, the problems with wind energy are its intermittency, number one, and its variability. So it doesn't blow all the time, and when it blows, it can't make up its mind whether it's a hurricane or, or, a, or a puff. This way we can uh, s store the energy, and it, it, these units are actually quite efficient, but it's still based on that ancient technology of heating up stones and uh, the stones retaining the heat with a slow release. Next. And when it comes to the semaphore, what we've begun to install, we're about halfway done, is a community fiber network. That's the communication piece of it, whereby we can control these devices in people's homes such that we can uh, optimize and monitor the use of, of the energy as well as dispatch it at the best times. Next. So we've got the three analogs uh, from ancient to new, and what we've done is created MyPowerNet, which is the name of the program we have, which uh, is designed to uh, promote efficient building systems. Uh, uh, the internet can go over the fiber. Uh, the fiber is also used as a communications uh, conduit for controlling all sorts of devices. Uh, we've got cars down there. We've, the city has started a fleet of using electric vehicles. So the energy it, it's using, getting from the wind, which is green energy, is actually going into the vehicle. So we've got three vehicles, three fully electric vehicles and three hybrids, which uh, are more or less powered by wind energy. Next. And in PEI, we don't have any wat. We don't have any water we can use for hydro, and there's no nuclear. But there's tons and tons of wind. And tell me about it. <laughs> Next, in our utility, we've got 7,000 customers. Uh, that shows the our consumption of electricity, and we buy, sell, and produce electricity. And that fits that model of the community where uh, in a, you know, within a small radius, we're servicing everybody's uh, electrical energy needs. Next. So we're up to about 50% now. Uh, that's not all from our own wind turbines. We also buy uh, wind energy a little further up the western seaboard of PEI. Next. Uh, sometimes there's too much wind, like I was saying, and the, the reason that my power net got started was that we were having to dump wind uh, sales. We were, we were selling it, but we were selling it at qu quite a loss, actually, uh, at low price. And trying to match up the demand with, with the wind was something that was a difficult problem to solve. This is where the, the storage uh, is the godsend. And... The motivation for the MyPowerNet program came with why are we selling energy off island when we could uh, uh, try to find loads in our own community that would also be economical and that would also displace fossil fuels. And hence uh, the, the MyPowerNet program was, was hatched out of that. So next so what happens is that we charge the customers who use this program a lot less for the energy, but which is a lot more than what we would get by selling it off island. The folks in the businesses that use the uh, furnaces and the hot water devices uh, are saving about 30 to 40 percent on their energy bills as opposed to using uh, oil. And they're also uh, displacing huge amounts of, uh, of GHG, gar uh, greenhouse gra gases as well. Next. Uh, the, this is the main point I want to make. This is that when you're getting into the energy game, you're getting into a very diverse, multivarious uh, uh, area of, of public policy and local community development. It doesn't have to be just the energy. It can be what spawns from that. So as I said, we're, we're working with a company, we're working with actually Nissan 
on electric cars, and we're working with a company in Japan on storage uh, so that we can have uh, see if we can develop more sophisticated ways to store our energy. We're also looking at filling up the space under our turbines with uh, solar because uh, we can it's, – it's quite a technology, and I'm sure my other experts here would know more about it than me, but placing wind, wind turbines, they, they have to be quite far apart for them to work properly. But with all the intervening space, it goes more or less unused. So we're looking into creating what we're calling a solar garden to supplement and increase uh, our own self-sufficiency. And of course, there's the uh, smart grids. Uh, we're also working on smart grid technology. We're actually uh, working with the Department of Natural Resources, uh, some research people with the federal government on um, developing smarter smart grids. Next. And the work that we've done in Summerside has uh, attracted some repute around around the world and uh, in the country and regionally. And I'd be happy to speak to anybody afterwards as well. And that's my presentation. And, uh, thank you again and good morning. And I want to thank Evan and, of course, my comrade in arms here, Dana, who I also play in a band with as well. So we have fun <laughs> and together. Um, again, uh, my name is Eric Christmas. I'm the Director of Operations for the Mi'kmaq Bubasom Wind um, Company. It's a company that is owned by uh, 13 First Nations here in, in the province of Nova Scotia. It is a remarkable achievement, which we spent the better part of 40 years trying to actually get. Uh, I got 10 minutes, so 40 years and 10 minutes, that's like 15 seconds a year, so, <laughs> so I can't do that. And I, I hate these things. I, don't, I hate slides. I hate going off of them, so I'm not going to really do it there because um, as I was coming up here this morning, I thought, Whenever I do a presentation, it's usually with my colleagues, associates, and other First Nations. So we all have the same shared background, the same history, the same sort of uh, experiences. And so I realized looking around the room, I don't see really anyone here from my own community. So I don't think you guys would probably not have a real great um, uh, appreciation or get knowledge as to how difficult it really was to get to where we are today. It's really, it's a great story. And um, Mi'kmaq are known for telling stories rather than doing these dang thing. So I want to tell you guys a couple of stories. Now I'll, I'll get to this and it'll be fast. Stories. Um, the difficult, so it begins for us really back when I guess in Canada first became a country in 1867. And if you could imagine um, having every aspect of your life being governed by an act, uh, that would be a pretty awful thing. That's who we were back then. The Indian Act of 1867 governed everything that the Mi'kmaq or any other First Nations in, in, you know, in Canada could actually do everything from your livelihood, your school. Um, we couldn't vote until 1961, so and and that was again in the in the in the in the act. But there are there are there are three parts of it that I want to talk about, which will I think I think highlight how difficult a struggle it was for us to get to where we are today, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, in terms of finance and raising equity, that's obviously a major importance for anyone that's trying to get into business. If you're doing wind projects or or, or whatever, you want to attract. Uh, you know, finance and equity and investment and uh, funding, and uh, it's always a challenge for us. It's a challenge for you guys, I'm sure it is as well. But the Indian Act had a very specific clause in it that basically said, because we all lived um, on, on these reserves, and uh, because these were like tribal, tribal, tribal lands, but, but, but we didn't own them. They were owned actually by the, by the Crown. And the Act was very specific in how we could use those, those, those lands. Um, non-transferable, which, which would mean that if you're going into a bank and you want to sort of uh, you know, get a, a loan to fix your, fix, fix, fix your roof, the bank will say no because we can't, we can't lien it because it's not allowable. If you're a band trying to do business, trying to, to, to raise funds to, to uh, build a store, a gas, or anything easy, it, it, can't, it can't be done. I can, I can really only recall our first, fin our first finance um, activity was around 2000. It took us that long. Um, we had to sort of, re, you know, to the, create, create the companies to, to actually do that. So the Indian Act said we couldn't raise equity or finance because nothing that we possessed could ever be transferred. So that's our, uh, so that was our first challenge. Just so raising equity and finance, almost impossible to do. The second one's more of a personal story. More so for my, um, for my father and one of our biggest challenges that we have always had, and I've worked in this industry for so many years, is that trying to attract and to have a great home base of, 
of, of, of solid Mi'kmaq and solid First Nations that have, a, have the, the background and, and expertise. It's been a big struggle for us for many years, and I can I, I can I think tell you why that why that actually was, and there's our, I, again two reasons. One, I think many of you are aware that we had a very different schooling system, again governed by the by the by the Act. Um, the the the, um, the residential school system was so um, constrictive in what it was allowing students to actually to actually learn, and it was by comparison to the sort of average or to, or to the off reserve school, it was very much. Uh, not even close to what uh, you guys had. Um, the sort of idea was that uh, you know, the, um, the students would be there to, to learn to be basically labor and uh, maybe even a trade if you, if you're lucky. Uh, the girls in the school were taught to be basically to be like servants and to be working in you know, maids. And so we didn't have um, the base that we could build on. That was a big challenge for us. My father personally went to that, to that school he never, he never, he never talks to me about it, and and I, I ask him, but he says he, he he just he just can't for a number of reasons. But, uh, um, but the other aspect of of, of 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 the act that was really constricting to us, that really explains a lot as to why we it, it took us so long to get to where we are today, is there was a, a provision in there that basically said, um, and so the act would would also govern who who um who we could actually marry, and uh, if you were a Mi'kmaq man marrying a non-Mi'kmaq lady or a, a non-Aboriginal lady, um, the non-Aboriginal lady um, would gain would gain would gain would, would gain status, and uh, you know, and again, he would um, maintain his. If um, a Mi'kmaq woman married a non-Mi'kmaq man, she would lose her status and would be forced off off of, off, off of the reserve. But there was another provision in there that was really not very well known, but affected my father personally and us personally as well. And the provision was that if you were looking to go to school, uh, to a post-secondary school, and if you were seeking what back then was just marginal um, support, um, you had to get, basically see to weigh your rights as, as, as a Mi'kmaq person. And that's what he had to do. My, my father wanted to be a teacher. He was really, that's what was his, was, his, was his dream. And a very noble profession, as anyone would uh, attest to. And in 1956, he had to actually after he, he, after he had um, graduated from high school, which was amazing for him, uh, he had to give away his rights to, get, to go to school. And uh, he had attained a master's degree, and uh, he became a teacher. Very proud of him for that. But the, so I asked the said, I said, Dad, so why, why would that be? The, why, why would the act not allow us to, you know, to do that? He said, well, he said what the act was trying to say was that they didn't want to, um, if you were... Going off, off, off the reserve to you know to um, to seek education, they didn't want you to be coming back with that with that knowledge, to make to affect 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 change, and he said that's why he felt that I was there. So we had numerous challenges right from the start to to ever do anything you know within our, within our own 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 bands. Um, politically, uh, 13, 13 bands are, are all very different. Um, some are very powerful, some are not very powerful. M my own band, which is in, 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 in Member 2, which is a great story unto itself, and I'll be very quick with this one, because I, I, I was speaking to um, a person uh, um, uh, as, as I had arrived, and he, and he said, oh, you must be from Sydney. And, uh, and, he, and he mentioned that, that, you know, that Member 2 now is doing really well, which we, of course we are. Um, but the story was, back in 1994, I mean, uh, and if there's anyone here from um, Sydney, which, which, which I'm also from, I mean this in no disrespect at all. <laughs> but uh, we were of the same sort of ilk in that whenever we were faced with any sort of um, problems or any sort of uh, failures, we, all, we, we always blamed uh, somebody, somebody else. It's, it was never our fault. Oh, it's, it's, always, it's much Ottawa's fault or it's Halifax's fault. Or it's, 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 it's INAC's fault, you know, uh, the uh, agency that actually governs us. And back then, Member 2 was a uh, population of about 500 people. Uh, our, our budget was about $3 million. Our debt was about a million, and no assets at all to ever, to ever cover off debt. And, uh, and then one day, um, the council said, they asked a very simple question. They said, rather than blaming anyone, they said, is there something that we're doing that's so fundamentally wrong that's not allowing us to basically grow? And when you ask a question like that, you're forced to then to then to then answer it. And the question and the answer was, we didn't respect money. I mean, to us, money was simply there to to uh, to repair a, a doorknob, paint a wall, fix a fence, 
you know, appease voters, really. And, 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 and so the council did the most amazing thing, I thought, that, that councils, I've ever seen council do, is they just started to say no. And that's a difficult thing to do. When you have a population that's used to hearing yes, now you're saying no, it was brutal for them. Um, the second thing that we had done, so, so we, we had said no for about three, four years. And in 1997, had our first, our very first balanced budget, which was a, for us was a big accomplishment for us. And we did another thing that I thought was really amazing that, that changed everything for us. The, the big change for us was in 97, the band posted its, um, its audit on, on, on the web, which for us was a big thing because it, it showed everyone else, including our own membership, that we were transparent and open, and we wanted everyone to know exactly what we were doing. We got, we got phone calls from chiefs from everywhere, all from the, uh, and, and, and I won't use the words because, I mean, their, uh, their language was quite harsh, actually. But they said, what are you guys doing? Because, and uh, my chief said, what? What do you mean? He said, well, Ottawa is going to want all of us to be, to be doing this now. And, and, and my chief said, so that's what you guys should be doing. You can't just, you can't hide it. And from, from that one little action, we were able to raise um, equity and investment in spite of, 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 of the act, and to build, and, and, and to begin to build a memory to, to where it is today. Uh, a, 200 million, a $200 million budget, budget uh, today. Uh, we have uh, numerous, numerous um, uh, adventures. Gaming, obviously, is our, it's, it's the biggest one, but we have, we have fishing, which is a big, big um, 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 venture for us. Uh, we have uh, hotels, we have a major convention center now. And it's, it's all because of, 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 of of thinking around a problem, now I can I can go in, in, into 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 Indiana. Yeah, so that's our that's the so and this would be about no more than about about um, uh, two minutes. So just click it and we can go. I'll be I'll be quick about this. So the assembly, which I have to talk to you guys about, because again, it's so much information. Thanks for ten minutes. Um, but to be very quickly about this, we have again we have a, we have um, a thirteen communities. In 1999, there was a, a um, um, Supreme Court ruling regarding what's called Aboriginal title. And very quickly, it just simply means, it doesn't mean that we, that we, that we own the land. It means that we have this, there's this, um, like an like a in, 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 in inherent um, um, uh, duty about that land. That's what, that's, that's, that's what, the, what the case basically said. And so it said that for every project, there is now Aboriginal title that, that must be dealt with and through consultation. Well, we, we weren't in any way organized for that, for that, for that, for that at all. Um, the chiefs tried to put together teams and call, and, 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 you know, uh, and all that, but it just wasn't working. So, so they felt we have, to do, we have to do something else that's more, because cause what, they, what they saw, what they saw coming, coming, coming down was a much greater thing. And so the assembly was then formed, and what the assembly really is, and I could spend all day on this one alone, it's simply, it is our Mi'kmaq government now. It is an assembly of chiefs that represent all, all 13 communities, and they essentially meet and they will decide in, 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 in real time those issues that affect us all as, 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 as bands. I have, I've had the honor of working for them for about six years. I still work for them now, but in a, a diff different way. And so it was the assembly, one second, there's some water here, that, ah, oh, breathe. So it was the assembly <laughs> getting that to where we are today, because I know that this, this is, this is, is all, all of our energy. Um, that I had to make that, or that I had to actually convince that to get them into these, to, to these projects. And the way I did it was, was differently. We had, uh, click, we had actually um, uh, uh, formed uh, Megba Renewable Energy. No, oh, go ahead, again. We had, we had basically, um, uh, uh, for them, and, and, and I was the one that was asked to, um, to um, do it, to build for them a Mi'kmaq Renewable, renewable energy, 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 energy Plan. It was a big, thick, thick binder, and uh, basically it was it was it was about about um, about um, a conflict projects and and like getting into wind and getting into hydro and getting everything else. But that's not what sold them on this. It was there was four pages of a of a, a 500 page report that spoke about 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 something else that was really only an add on at the very end. And what that was was like it was we had basically found that I I asked a question. I said. I know that our chiefs are, are are concerned about the fact that that we're not very efficient in terms of using of using using power, and but we want to know what the actual number was. How how different were we from our you know from 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 um, 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 others? And so we actually went to the um, to the uh, um, power corp 
and we ask for uh, two years of actual bills. We want to know the actual number of, of, of every First Nations home and to, to then compare that number to, to you know, people in Halifax, or Sydney, or in Truro. And when that, in that little one little page of that four-page little, little insert, uh, I put that onto a screen for the, uh, for the, uh, for the chiefs, and they went, they went ballistic because they, were, they, had, they had known this for, for years, but they didn't know the actual impact of it all, that we were using upwards to 2.4 times the actual amount of power that the average person was actually using. And what they had known was that that was going to be a major issue for us because for most bands, funding is, again, it's uh, uh, very limited, it's very tight, and uh, you know, securing energy for the, for, the, for, the, for the future for us was going to become a major issue for us because that was, that was, that, that was the train coming, 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 coming down the uh, tracks. So that drove everything. So it was, it was that one little thing that, that, that got the chiefs talking about this whole strategy. And then it took me 18 months. And if you've ever, I've been to many of, the, of these, of, 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 their, of, their, of their other meetings, and they would be meet for you know, six, seven hours a day, and they'd be exhausted and tired and sometimes very cranky. And I would have five, five or um, 10 minutes at the very end to begin to you know, sell them on this whole strategy, which was about getting us into, the, um, into, into, into wind. And uh, in these little five and uh, ten, ten minute snippets, I had to kind of, you know, give them uh, some kind of knowledge about what this is and the technology of this is and how it's to be financed, what, what, this, what, this, what, this, what this will mean. And it was only in, 19, in, no, it's only in 2013 in April when they finally said yes after, after about two years of me you know, trying them, them. Okay, just flip, flip it again. So finally, after all that story and, my, and, and the back story, and, um, and, and to where we are now, today, um, with that, we had now, they had allowed me to basically go out and, and, and to raise finance and equity to build uh, two um, major, 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 major projects. One not uh, was just commissioned um, this past November. Uh, the first three months of data have, ne have now come back. We are doing extremely well uh, with it um, financially. Um, we're building another project late, uh, um, later in this year, and that'll be in um, 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 Amherst. And, but the most amazing thing about all this stuff, and I'm, I'm gonna end, end it here because I know, be, I know the time's an issue, is that it's, it's, it's not these, these um, projects at all that's the most important thing. It's the fact that what the assembly did to, 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 basically to, to actually build them was that, and this took us 40, 40 years to do, and I, I wish there was a big moment here, but there wasn't when, when, it, when it actually happened. They said, go out and build a company. Go out and form a structure that would be different, that would be um, um, not within the assembly. It's not political. It's going to be a business, a business structure. And I put the assets there, put the finance there, and, and then Eric, you go and then get them, get them built. And so um, a Boba song was then basically launched. At tour. This is where I work at today. <coughs> and we are now, uh, again, proud to, proud to say that we just commissioned um, a why not? Amherst would be commissioned uh, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming year. Uh, $32 million in the projects there. We are about to launch uh, um, uh, Northern, Northern, Northern Lights, Northern, Northern Lights LE, LE, Northern, Northern Lights Energy, which is a company which will be producing or we're selling um, LE, 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 LED products. And now Northern Lights Finance, which is for me was amazing because when I, when I first began this, this speech, I, I, I talked about the fact that the Indian Act we couldn't raise finance. Now we're going to have our own our own firm at doing it. So, so with so that, I want to end it all and say thank you very much. <laughs> all right, here you go, sir. Still a humble representation of the struggle and journey. Uh, certainly not as mine was much shorter than yours. Um, I think we now have about 15 minutes or so, and of course the, the spirit of this is speaking in between sessions and all around, but I'll throw it back out um, and see if we can't get some dialogue. And we have a microphone that we would prefer you use. Be great. Who's first? I'm just curious just to know, what, is, what are the, in the storage, Storage has always been the holy grail of all new energies. What is the current efficiency of the best storage uh, projects now, and what's coming down the pike? What kind of technologies would you think would uh, emerge in the next while? The um, standard for, uh, sorry, it's about a little bit over 70 percent 
a, a very good lead acid battery or other battery banks can achieve that, so can, can uh, compressed air storage. Pumped hydro is in the same range. Um, and the, um, the augmented compressed air storage that's being worked on in Nova Scotia will be somewhat better than that. Um, there's a recent study by the Rocky Mountain Institute that predicts that within the next 30 years, much of North America, in much of North America, the combination of solar and storage will be competitive with grid electricity. So it's going to change back. I just have one more question. Um, sometime about a decade ago, maybe 12 years ago, in Prince Edward Island, um, one of the premiers, I don't remember, maybe the elder Giz, I don't know which had this notion to um, use surplus wind power to uh, produce hydrogen, mm -hmm. and then there would be some of a hydrogen economy. Whatever came of that, it seems to have vanished. Hyd the hydrogen economy is technically challenging. Uh, it's a, a very inefficient process, and there's no distribution system for it. So it's a, it's a chicken-egg situation to some extent. The um, tidal site in, in Orkney in Scotland has just decided to put in hydrogen to convert the tidal power because there's no grid. That's the most expensive hydrogen you would ever make. That's also so as cheap wind you might even then it's it gets pretty expensive. Distribution I think is the main thing as Don said. Yeah. There's no network to get. One of my off grid friends up. describes hydrogen, the hydrogen economy as an extremely inefficient battery. Could someone talk a little bit about conservation? You, you all talked about how to supply energy, but what about reducing our need? I believe there's a representative from Efficiency Nova Scotia right in front of you. <laughs> um, anyone want to jump in on that? I, 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 I'm a strong efficiency person. Uh, there's also a business reason it's cheaper to use less energy than it is to bring on new generation. So there's also, that's why we have a business model of, uh, what's our word for them, megawatts, megawatts, um, that the reduction of, saving of energy is worth money. So I think when I look at the government the last eight or nine years, I think we've, we did all we could on the uh, large scale and small scale renewables. We've saturated the grid with Comfit. We've uh, pretty much handed out all the large wind projects. Our grid is pretty well, Don, I'm not sure how we're supposed to do renewable to retail if we can't fit any more energy on the grid. But, and back to this, my point about moving our eyes to transportation now. I think that's all been done. The government I see right now, the Liberals anyway, is to focus on businesses and homes and, and efficiency, local generation, reducing demand, load shaping, load demand, all these kind of things in, in partnership with your local utility like Don or Nova Scotia Power. So I think that's where all the focus will be for the next few years is, is working on uh, the efficiency side and the businesses and homes. Um, and we're seeing a lot of like passive house uh, design rules coming in for homes that um, not using as much energy, I think, is the point. So I think it is now almost more important than the renewables, the next phase, and probably where our opportunities um, are, but those are also local opportunities. Anyone else on that? Just quickly, and I, again, I mentioned before in my speech that we had done um, in, in our in Nigmo strategy, we had kind of released the figures as to just how sort of dire that the actual you know that it was in terms of us using power, and 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 the reasons why that actually is, it's not it's not as as, as simple as you think it is. Um, when we're building homes on, on on the reserves, obviously, you want to build as 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 many as you as you as you as you as you as you as you, as you can. So so you so you so you build them cheaply. And um, the difference between putting in a efficient, you know, either like a heat pump system or, a, or even like a, a boiler, versus just versus going to Costco and then getting some, you know, uh, heaters, uh, it's it's a vast difference. And so, like seven thousand dollars, I said seven thousand dollars difference. So the when we did the actual report, and then with again efficiency here, and we worked with them as well, we we had gone into every single home, or about no, sorry, we went into about two thousand homes out of um, three thousand homes, and actually began to. Um, to do some very simple things, first of all, and this is again with 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 assembly's blessing, we first gone in and we had just changed light bulbs. Simple thing to do, we, like we taken out the old ones and put in these, the more um, um, the more efficient bulbs. We had uh, uh, ranked uh, uh, wrapped some um, um, tanks, and we put in low 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 flow shower heads and uh, and, and thoughts. It's a very simple thing to do. 
the savings of that alone, just for one year, was worth three hundred thousand dollars just by doing almost nothing, and that got the chiefs really talking about that. Um, but more importantly, though, I think what was the, the apex of that whole uh, program and, 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 and the approach was that we had, uh, we had engaged Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq youth to, you know, to, uh, to also go in and to speak with the, with the, um, with the resident about why this is so important. Um, you go to any uh, First Nations reserve today and you'll see housing stock that's, that's, that's subpar in, 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 many, in, many, in many, many cases. Uh, because of, of, of other issues in, in terms of social issues, you'll see uh, homes where there's there's three and four um, like families in, the, in those homes. So so demand for, for power is again much much greater um, because there's lack of lack lack of uh, jobs. You know there's there's uh, there's there's always more than more than uh, um, you know, more more people in those homes as well because there's there's nowhere else to go. So it's a big problem for us. Um, you know, we we have always. Stress to our, you know, that uh, that 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 we hold um, that that is very very you know, very 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 close to our like to our to our, to our hearts, but we're working on that one, and uh, I think we're hopefully about to announce very shortly a major partnership with um, again with um, um, with um, Efficiency One, and to do something on a much larger 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 scale. So, so just uh, yeah. Another question. Um, a num excuse me. A number of the presenters mentioned the Comfit program and how important it's been in getting these projects going. But it's also mentioned that that program is now being halted. It's been halted in terms of new new intake. And I was wondering if you could say a little more about what the, what has led to that uh, being uh, you know being halted for now. There was some mention of the grid saturation. I just would like a little more detail about what the what the problem is, is that in any way related to Muskrat Falls and the big amounts of power that are about to come online from that? And any sense of how long uh, we're going to be without that policy or is it going to come back anytime soon? Uh, there are two reasons for the, uh, at least the abeyance of the Comfit program. One is, one is the cost of the energy it's bringing into the system. It's going to cost uh, uh, roughly $30 million more than other fuel sources would in this year and $60, $60 million more in the next year. And that's borne by all ratepayers. The other reason is the difficulty of managing that much variable energy on the grid. Because you have to be able to follow the load and you're doing that with a, uh, with a steam plant that isn't very well designed for that purpose. Muskrat Falls will actually enable uh, more um, renewables to come on the grid because th to some extent that energy will be what we call in the business dispatchable. You can say you can have it when you want it. So you can ramp, hydro ramps up and down quite quickly, whether it's in Bear River or in uh, Labrador. And uh, that will be a, that will somewhat mitigate the situation. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the cost figure. We're all paying for this, of course, out of our taxpayer money. Uh, this incentive, but it wasn't a negative thing is they originally called for hundred megawatts I think the applications from around the province were closer to 200 megawatts mm -hmm. And they're all being built so I, and we do have a saturation issue on the grid. So I think it was um, Just simply the program was fully <coughs> subscribed, which is a, a success to the government um, And I think now we need to step back and there are very few what I call holes left on the grid where you could actually mm. put any kind of power anywhere in the province so we're we've got a bigger problem now is how do we uh, Increase demand though. We're trying to reduce demand at the same time. It's a quandary um, How do we produce more power and who's it for? I think the biggest issue is load following uh, It's a bigger issue right now. We're allowed to produce only the minimum load in our community. Um, what that means is in our community on one day a year, the <coughs> least you ever use, which is calculated about a third of our maximum, that's all we're allowed to ever make, right? Not today, our power's here and goes like this all day. We're only allowed to make the minimum amount ever produced in our community. In other words, you're not allowed to supply the total amount of energy your community needs under the current rules. Um, so until we can meet demand on a real-time basis, which is enabled by smart grid, smart technology, storage, all those things coming, we are still in a uh, position of, and it's a business thing. We're, let's not forget, we're talking a private corporation. We have nothing against. I just want the shareholders to be from my community. 
and st and that's it. It's not bad or good or anything. It's just wrong shareholders. Um, those are some of the factors in around. Hi there. Thank you. So it, what you're describing with reference to the Confit program is sort of a, a window of opportunity that has, that has closed for certain sorts of development. So if you were to be giving advice to a municipality like the municipality of the county of Annapolis on developing a, a community energy program in, in the, with the current state of affairs, what would be your best bet for, for a, a direction we should take? In Annapolis, you could probably use the net metering program to self-supply all the needs of the municipality within the town. Um, I'm not certain you couldn't do the same thing as if, if a, a group of place in Tatamagos, it's essentially a cooperative of people who are going to organize their loads into one entity and use net metering to self-supply. So that's worth exploring. I think what we need to understand is who has the power in any relationship, and it's the consumer, the buyer. Municipalities have one of the biggest power bills. You get one from the library there, one from the fire hall, and in the old days you couldn't um, aggregate your bills. You know, I can put a turbine supply directly that but I can't. Mm -hmm. When you add those bills all up, you are multi-million dollar buyers of energy. To this morning's keynote, if you bought that from a local supplier instead of from away, what a difference your power bill makes. If you can go one further and be making it yourself as a municipality, supplying your old, own needs, and as Don says, net metering is a simple way of letting the rest of that go, maybe at a as an incentive, that's where I go for businesses. Move your large company here and uh, we'll guarantee you a rate. That creates economic stimulus, companies coming. I always look at humans, not infrastructure. We had some crazy number to build transmission from Briar Island, I think half a billion or something. Imagine if we had a half billion to put into companies to locate down here in Annapolis and Digby how much energy would be. I would rather put it into to the humans, right, which create the demand. Mm -hmm. But I think that municipal of Annapolis, you have some interesting opportunities and, and they keep, they will change over time. But yeah, you control a big, I'd love you guys to be a customer of ours. <laughs> <laughs> got an idea of it. I don't know if I can explain it. Another one. <laughs> if 50 people got together and the 50 people wanted to have 50 small generators installed in their backyards, they form a company and the, those 50 people are the first customers. Is that doable? As of September, we should see rules that would enable you to self-produce and determine who your customer is and set the price. So yes. So like I'm one of the 50 people. Yep. I'd sell my power to the, to the, to the, I'm sorry, I'd pay for the power that I consume. I'd pay the money to the company, but since I'm a shareholder, I'd get a considerable Ex portion of that back. Exactly. So, so that will be doable. It is, un would be doable under the new retail rules. Amen. So when you start, uh, back to Dawn about, uh, municipalities working together. We do have a transmission tariff that allows that exchange of power. Now we're going to have a distribution tariff. Um, so whether it's a group of municipalities saying, let's own a wind farm up in Guysborough County and just put it there, um, or it doesn't matter where it, it the, the difference is it doesn't matter where the power is anymore in that kind of model. We used to, have, we're stuck here at home and we may not have the best tide or wind or solar, but we have something. So it doesn't matter where you make it. So I think that the aggregation, so privately I'm in, I use CETUS and the people that I work with know how to do that. So we're saying we're 25 business owners with big power bills. Let's all chip in, own the darn turbine, sell it back to our company, save money, but I'm getting the personal tax credit and I'm making profit. So That's my company my made, <laughs> saved money, I made money, we supply ourselves, we've locked in the rate. So they have a very new thinking in Nova Scotia of the, uh, so I'm just encouraging municipalities to think about it and yourself, you own the power bill. I'm good for 100 a month. And when you put that in a pile in your community, it quickly grows. The Scotian Winfields is neat. Each of those groups are very different, like any community, different people. But you're approaching about 4,000 4, shareholders. So when it was started 10 years ago, it was the idea that when we get to sell to retail, who are you going to buy from? 
we're going to buy from your own company that you started and in your own community, and you can't beat that in a uh, permission marketing and a consumer, you know, grabbing market share from Nova Scotia Power is what you're talking about. Um, you can't beat that. So you're in charge. You, you that are buying the power, we always have been. We just, uh, how we spend our money is makes a, a, a statement. Casey, you're going to buy from yourself. Yep. It's 12.30. It's 12.30. That's okay. Yeah, how about a...